Welcome to St Mary's Claverton for our live stream service on this Sunday between Ascension Day and Pentecost, a time when in the first century the Apostles having seen the Lord Jesus raised into heaven, they're waiting in Jerusalem for the Holy Spirit to come, waiting to be clothed with power from on high. And it's a time of waiting for us as well, waiting for the Lord to send his Holy Spirit in greater power, making more of a difference for us. And we pray uh, with Christians all over the world for the Lord to do that. Before we uh, sing our first hymn, a couple of notices. Um, there's my mobile phone number on the screen, uh, 07905 883 075. Do please send me a text and it would be lovely if you would got something to say to the rest of the church family, um, some kind of greeting. It's good to keep in touch in that kind of way. And thank you for those who've been doing it. Please do keep doing it. And at the end of the service, um, I will read out some texts We've been having uh, coffee mornings, virtual coffee mornings that is, on Zoom. Uh, uh, we've had two so far and the last one was uh, nearly two weeks ago. The next one is this Wednesday, 10 o'clock. Uh, the Zoom details I've sent out in the email um, and they'll come up later on the screen here. And if you haven't used Zoom before, do give me or Hugh a call. You may be able to see Hugh's phone number down here um, and uh, it's in some of the emails I've sent out as well. As I mentioned these emails, if you haven't been receiving those, do go on the church website marysclaverton.org.uk and uh, you can sign up there to opt in to the mailing list to receive email updates. Wednesday is also uh, when Anne Hopkins Clark's funeral will be. Sadly, we can't invite everyone to that. I'm sure lots of people would love to come to remember and give thanks for Anne and support her family. Uh, but the, the best, uh, most supportive thing, sadly, is to stay away and pray. Um, and so uh, do thank you for those, for those who sent cards to Joanna and the family already. Grace, mercy and peace to you from God our Father be with you. And also with you. Sorry for that slight uh, misreading of that greeting and let me give a, um, a seasonal greeting as well. Uh, Excuse me for getting a bit mixed up here. Um, we'll come back to some seasonal things for this Ascension time. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Well done, Samuel, thank you. And uh, our first hymn is Great is Thy Faithfulness, O God our Father.
we have come together in the name of Christ to offer our praise and thanksgiving, to hear and receive God's holy word, to pray for the needs of the world, and to seek the forgiveness of our sins that by the power of the Holy Spirit we may give ourselves to the service of God. Seeing we have a great high priest who has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith and make our confession to our Heavenly Father. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. May the Father of all mercies cleanse us from our sins and restore us in his image to the praise and glory of his name. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Blessed is the Lord, for, for he, he has, has heard, heard the, the voice, voice of our prayer. Therefore shall our hearts dance for joy, and, and in our song will we praise our, our God. O oh, come, let us sing to the Lord, let us heartily rejoice in the rock of our salvation. Let us come before his presence with come into his presence with thanksgiving and be glad in him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand are the depths of the earth and the heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his, for he made it, and his hands have moulded the dry land. Come, let us worship and bow down and kneel before the Lord our Maker. For he is our God, we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Oh, that today you would listen to his voice. Harden not your hearts as at Meribah on that day at Massa in the wilderness, when your fathers tested me and put me to the proof, though they had seen my work. Forty years long I detested that generation and said, This people are wayward in their hearts, they do not know my ways. So I swore in my wrath, they shall not enter into my rest. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. Let's say together Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I lack nothing. He makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside quiet waters. He refreshes my soul. He guides me along the right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely your goodness and love will follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and shall be forever. Amen. Our um, first reading is going to be brought to us by Stella. And we've heard in the last couple of weeks some oracles of Isaiah against enemy nations. And this oracle today has the enigmatic heading, an oracle concerning the Valley of Vision. And it's not immediately clear who it's about, but a few verses in, we'll realise he's talking shockingly about Jerusalem, the Lord's own city. The first reading is taken from Isaiah chapter 22 verses 1 to 25 which is in fact the whole of the chapter. What troubles you now? 
that you have all gone up on the roofs. You town so full of commotion. You city of tumult and revelry. Your slain were not killed by the sword, nor did they die in battle. All your leaders have fled together. They have been captured without using the bow. All you who are caught were taken prisoner together, having fled while the enemy was still far away. Therefore I said, turn away from me, let me weep bitterly. Do not try to console me over the destruction of my people. The Lord, the Lord Almighty has a day of tumult and trampling and terror in the valley of vision. A day of battering down walls and of crying out to the mountains. Elam takes up the quiver with her charioteers and horses. Kier uncovers the shield. Your choicest valleys are full of chariots and horsemen are posted at the city gates. The Lord stripped away the defences of Judah and you looked in that day to the weapons in the palace of the forest. You saw that the walls of the city of David were broken through in many places. You saw that water in the lower pool you counted the buildings in Jerusalem and tore down houses to strengthen the wall. You built a reservoir between the two walls for the water of the old pool, but you did not look to the one who made it or have regard for the one who planned it long ago. The Lord, the Lord Almighty called you on that day to weep and to wail, to tear out your hair and put on sackcloth. But see, there is joy and revelry, slaughtering of cattle and killing of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink, you say, for tomorrow we die. The Lord Almighty has relieved this in my, revealed this in my hearing. Till your dying day, this sin will not be atoned for, says the Lord, the Lord Almighty. This is what the Lord, the Lord Almighty says. Go, say to this steward, to, Shep, to Shepna, the palace administrator, what are you doing here? And who gave you permission to cut out a grave for yourself here? Hewing your grave on the height and chiseling your resting place in the rock. Beware, the Lord is about to take firm hold of you and hurl you away, you mighty man. He will roll you up tightly like a ball and throw you into a dark, large country. There you will die. And there the chariots you were so proud of will become a disgrace to your master's house. I will depose you from your office and you will be ousted from your position. In that day, I will summon my servant Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and fasten your sash around him and hand your authority over to him. He will be a father to those who live in Jerusalem and to the people of Judah. I will place on his shoulder the key to the house of David. What he opens, no one can shut. And what he shuts, no one can open. I will drive him like a peg into a firm place. He will become a seat of honor for the house of his father. All the glory of his family will hang on him, its offspring and offshoots, all its larger vessels from the bowls to all the jars. In that day, declares the Lord Almighty, the peg driven into the firm place will give way. It will be sheared off and will fall and the load hanging on it will be cut down. The Lord 
has spoken. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. And thank you, Stella, so much for bringing us that reading. Now let's say all together the song of Moses and Miriam. I will sing to the Lord who has triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song and has become my salvation. This is my God whom I will praise, the God of my forebears whom I will exalt. The Lord is a warrior, the Lord is his name. Your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. At the blast of your nostrils the sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. In your unfailing love, O Lord, you lead the people whom you have redeemed. And by your invincible strength you will guide them to your holy dwelling. You will bring them in and plant them, O Lord, in the sanctuary which your hands have established. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. The second reading is taken from the Gospel of St Matthew, chapter 6, verses 25 to 34. Therefore I tell you, do not worry about your life, what you will eat or drink, or about your body, what you will wear? Is not life more than food, and the body more than clothes? Look at the birds of the air. They do not sow or reap or store away in barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not much more vulnerable than they? Can any one of you, by worrying by worrying at a single hour to your life. And why do you worry about clothes? See how the flowers of the field grow. They do not labor or spin. Yet I tell you that not even Solomon in all his splendor was dressed like one of these. If that is how God clothes the grass of the field, which is here today, and tomorrow is thrown into the fire. Will he not much more clothe you, you of little faith? So do not worry saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the pagans run after all these things and your heavenly father knows that you need them. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about itself. Each day has enough troubles of its own. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be, be to God. God. Your word, O Lord, is eternal. It stands firm in the heavens. Bring that word down into our hearts and may it stand firm there. Increase our faith and may we take joy in knowing you, loving Father. Amen. Short-termism is in the long run a disastrous approach to life. It can be so hard to plan ahead or to have a long-term big picture in mind as we live our daily lives, but long-term vision is as essential in life as it is on any journey where we need to know not only where to plant our feet or which way to turn at the next junction but where's our destination and in which direction should we be looking to make progress. We used to plan journeys by looking at maps and having an idea of the overall route before we started. Now most of us tend to put the destination into satnav and only think one step at a time so if satnav crashes we're left helpless sometimes the short term has to take over 
our thinking and our action. A child steps out into the road and we swerve to avoid them rather than sticking to our plan of not turning until we get to the next junction. Coronavirus threw a spanner in the works of many of our plans and we had to respond in an environment of uncertainty, unable to plan very far ahead because by the time we get to next month, so much might have changed again. With hindsight, we can criticise the government's approach at the start of the crisis, but at the time, we couldn't see any better than they could what was coming. In last week's prophecy, Isaiah spoke to both the long horizon and the short term. Eventually, Egypt would be included in God's people. But for now, says Isaiah, don't make an alliance with them, he warns the people of Judah, the leaders of Judah. In the short term, Egypt would be under God's judgment. In today's oracle, Isaiah speaks to Jerusalem. He calls it the Valley of Vision, a puzzling kind of phrase. Normally a mountaintop is where you have longer vision and Jerusalem is on top of a hill. So the title is ironic. A valley can be a dark place like the 23rd Psalms, Valley of the Shadow of Death. And maybe Isaiah felt he was in a dark place like that as the Lord gave him a vision about Jerusalem and its future. He highlights four mistakes that could be seen in Jerusalem in his day, all arising from a short-sighted outlook. So what are those mistakes? The first one is celebrating short-term deliverance but refusing to accept what lies ahead. Here's a bit of history. We'll read later on in Isaiah sometime, chapters 36 and 37, where the Assyrians, having defeated the northern kingdom of Israel in 722 BC and invaded Judah as well, besieged Jerusalem 20 years later. Those chapters are duplicated in 2 Kings 18 to 19 and also 2 Chronicles. They relate a very important event in the life of God's people. Isaiah foretells a rescue and his prophecy is fulfilled. In And uh, though Judah is remarkably delivered, God would then sadly hand them over to the Babylonians who would besiege and defeat Jerusalem in 597 BC, so after a hundred years, leading to its destruction 10 years later. It's the terrible thing you can read about in 2 Kings 24. That's why Isaiah is weeping bitterly in verse 4. What about us? Do we have big celebrations over small short-term victories whilst burying our hand, heads in the sand about the long-term future. I don't claim to have the vision for how bad things will be socially, politically or economically as we move into what people keep calling the new normal. Maybe we should have more celebration over the survival of the NHS and the fall in infection rates and death rates. Or maybe there's worse to come, I don't know. But what the Lord has revealed to me, and to you as well if you read his word, is an eternal perspective. You can't get more long-term than that. And the long-term future for those who don't know our Lord and Saviour Jesus is desperately grim. There may be things we can do to help our community's short-term needs and we can rejoice over any reduction in poverty, improvement in education, progress in addressing mental health, breakthroughs in medical research. But the thing that brings rejoicing in heaven, Jesus tells us, is when a sinner repents. The long-term future for any believer in Jesus is wonderfully bright. 
Any church needs to remember this as we respond to the needs of society. There's a danger of churches in this country taking our eye off the ball as we support the government's message of stay alert, control the virus, save lives. Of course, we must support that, but that's not all. We have something greater to offer as well. Saving lives or postponing death would be another way to put it, is not our big long-term goal. We can see a bigger need that people have and we have something to offer the world that is far more valuable. The gospel of Jesus which saves lives beyond death. The second mistake Isaiah saw being made in Jerusalem was looking to human plans and resources but not acknowledging God as their supplier. The big achievement of King Hezekiah for which he is remembered is his tunnel. You can still walk along this tunnel under the old city of Jerusalem for half a kilometre. It has a gradient of 0.1%. It was hewn out of solid rock by teams of labourers with pickaxes from both ends of the tunnel and nobody's quite sure how they managed to meet in the middle after this snaking route, presumably by some kind of sonic location hitting the rock with hammers or something. It was an engineering marvel and brought Jerusalem a great sense of security. The purpose of the tunnel was to bring water from the protected Gihon Spring to the lower pool in the city and have its overflow drain away into the porous rock rather than out into the valley. So if an enemy besieged the city, those inside could last for ages with fresh water while the attackers had no access to water. It was a defensive masterstroke. Scholars reckon it was done in less than four years, maybe as little as nine months. Maybe it's possible that the revelry in verse two was celebration when the two teams of diggers met in the middle. At the same time, with the Assyrians looming and threatening to besiege, Hezekiah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem frantically shored up their defences. They cannibalised people's houses in verse 10 for stone to bolster the walls. With walls, weapons and a water supply, who needed anything else? That was their problem. What looked like engineering and strategic prudent brilliance was the ultimate folly. God had promised to protect them. When he first gave the city to his people, God knew what water supply he had created for it. Hezekiah didn't create the water, he diverted it. Jerusalem became locked down into this near horizon of their own activism, which became the enemy of faith. There's nothing wrong with technology itself and nothing wrong with strategic th thinking. The people were using their God-given gifts, but the problem was they were relying on those gifts alone and forgetting God's promises. Well, there's a challenge to us again. Do we have this limited vision and DIY salvation? Sometimes we say, as long as I've got my health, that's the main thing. That's not the main thing. Or I just need to provide for my family and earn enough money to give them a secure future. We can't give them a secure future anyway. The best gift we can give our children and grandchildren is knowledge of the Lord Jesus who can give them a secure future for eternity. The third mistake Isaiah saw in Jerusalem happened when people finally realised how desperate their situation was for the future. Fatalistic feasting in the face of danger, but no repenting and seeking God's mercy. Verse 
verse 12, the Lord, the Lord Almighty called you on that day to weep and to wail, to tear out your hair and put on sackcloth. But see, there is joy and revelry, slaughtering of cattle and killing of sheep, eating of meat and drinking of wine. Let us eat and drink, you say, for tomorrow we die. Whereas in the second mistake we saw activism, which was a denial of faith, now we see escapism and a denial of repentance. Oh, there's nothing we can do. God is punishing us. We're going to die, the people in Jerusalem were saying. Correct. So let's enjoy what we have left of life. Eat and drink for tomorrow we die. Wrong. They'd been ignoring God, now they're still ignoring God. Do you remember the story of Jonah? Jonah went to that wicked city, Nineveh, which was the capital of Assyria, with the message from God, 40 more days and Nineveh will be destroyed. There was nothing there that they could do to stop this judgment coming, and yet what did they do? They repented and cried out for God's mercy and God loves to show mercy that's what the Lord is like that's what annoyed the peevish Jonah I knew that you're a gracious and compassionate God slow to anger and abounding in love a God who relents from sending calamity so what should the people of Jerusalem have done when they realised the city walls and water tunnel, tunnel weren't going to save them and there was nothing they could do to save themselves? They should have done what the people of Nineveh did and cast themselves on God's mercy. The people of Nineveh received God's mercy. He didn't send the threatened judgment as they should have done as Rahab the prostitute did when Jericho was destroyed and she and her family would, were saved. God loves to show mercy. He loves to treat us better than we deserve. Yes, he's a holy God and he does punish and we can't get ourselves out of that. But he's also compassionate and merciful and he can get us out of it. We just need to turn back to him as our king and ask for his mercy. Jesus died so that we could become God's friends. It's never too late unless we keep refusing the offer of his mercy. Sometimes I think the church today collaborates with the world's escapism. People don't want to hear about sin and forgiveness, we're told. They want to be uplifted and feel good about themselves the way they are. But if we shut up about sin and forgiveness, if we deprive people of the offer of life, we encourage them into this attitude of escapism, even where they're starting to recognise their desperate position before God, we owe it to everyone to introduce them to God's mercy. And the fourth error in Jerusalem, building a name and reputation for oneself, but not recognizing one's total dependence on the Lord. One individual exemplified this attitude that was seen in Jerusalem. His name was Shebna. He was in charge of the palace. We find that Hezekiah's tunnel wasn't the only expression of faithlessness hewn into the solid rock under the city. Uh, Shebna's love of pomp went as far as planning a tomb fit for a king for himself. In contrast, another court official called Eliakim shows the characteristics of a true leader. Look how they compare and this table coming up if some of you could just click through all the things on the table here they are the things that you can see in the passage uh, contrasting Shebna and Eliakim one who's disgraced and one is honoured because one is self-regarding one is servant of the Lord Eliakim is the one who is like a, a peg a reliable one fixed in the wall 
he's so ideal as one of the leaders. And so there's a sad surprise in verse 24. In that day, declares the Lord Almighty, the peg driven into the firm place will give way. It will be sheared off and will fall and the load hanging on it will be cut down. The Lord has spoken. Maybe it's Eliakim's own weakness. Maybe it's the failings of his family who hang on his glory like heavy items on the peg on the wall. But he is not up to the job of bearing the full weight of government of God's people. This is something that keeps happening all through the Old Testament. You keep getting what looks like an ideal leader and they turn out not to be ideal. Isaiah has already told us back in chapter 7 what we need. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. His name means God with us. When he comes, Isaiah sees in chapter 9, for to us a child is born, to us a son is given and the government will be on his shoulders. The zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. We need Emmanuel, just as the people of Jerusalem needed Emmanuel. Thank God he has sent us exactly what we need, or rather exactly who we need. God is with us. Emmanuel is Jesus. He's the same King as the Eternal Lord whom King David knew as his shepherd and we've already said Psalm 23 earlier on in the service. We're going to sing it now as well in the great hymn, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is. And let's say the creed together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, 
suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let's pray. When I say, Lord, in your mercy, if you'd like to respond, hear our prayer. Father, we pray for our government as they make very complex and difficult decisions about how to ease lockdown. Please graciously give them wisdom to choose what is best and strengthen them in this task. In this time of crisis where things are so obviously out of our control, we pray that the leaders of the world would come to acknowledge your sovereign power and understand that their authority actually comes from you. We pray that the nations of the world would cooperate peacefully in order to combat the virus together. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for key workers, asking that you would protect their safety. Thank you for the selfless acts of service from people who are putting their health at risk to care for others. Thank you that Jesus gave his life to save us from our sickness of sin. And we pray for the provision of adequate protective equipment for those who need it. We pray for people in financial difficulty and unemployment, asking that they would have faith and depend on you for provision. Please graciously look after them and give them what they need. We pray for those feeling lonely at home. Please remind them of your love and presence and grant them courage to face each day. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for our discipleship as a church. Thank you for working for our good in all situations, including this one. We pray that we would grow in our knowledge and love and trust in you through this difficult time. May our faith be refined by trials and may our contentment be more and more rooted in the surpassing worth of knowing Christ and having hope in him. We ask that we would be bold to take opportunities to share this hope with our friends and family who don't know Jesus. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Father of compassion and God of all comfort, we grieve together the loss of our sister in Christ, Anne Hopkins Clark. We remember her life with thanksgiving, thanking you for her friendship to us and service to the church. We pray that Joanna and the rest of the family would find hope amidst their sadness and that they would know your love for them at this time. We ask all these prayers in the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. O oh God, the King of glory, you have exalted your only Son, Jesus Christ, with great triumph to your kingdom in heaven. We beseech you, leave us not comfortless, but send your Holy Spirit to strengthen us and exalt us to the place where our Saviour Christ is gone before, who is alive and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Gathering our prayers and praises into one, let us pray with confidence as our Saviour has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Our 
our next hymn is Lord for the Years, Lord of the Years. And uh, during the hymn, you may like to consider it the offertory hymn. And there are some details on the screen about how to give uh, the best way being um, by direct bank transfer or standing order and you, you may well know the details already. A new way to give as well and um, perhaps if you aren't into the technology for bank transfers uh, you might have a mobile phone and be able to send a text um, or if uh, it's a, a one-off and easier for you do uh, feel free to use this method. The text number is 70460 and um, those are the it, the exact uh, word to text would be, for example, three St. Mary's. Um, and then it, as long as uh, your mobile phone bill has the credit, um, you can give that way. And we're very grateful for all gifts received by whatever means. Um, so we praise God for his faithfulness and perhaps might like to sing together.
the spirit of truth lead you into all truth, give you grace to confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and strengthen you to proclaim the word and works of God and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be upon us and remain with us always. Amen. We've um, had some texts coming in, so let me re just call those up on my phone and um, read them out. I've got one from Hugh, which is, I seem to have, ah, oh, here we are. Good morning to everyone. Hope you are all well. I've been enjoying reading through Romans at the moment. The gospel is the power of God for our salvation. Love to you all. And Stella says, thank you for a beautiful service, especially the Good Shepherd video. Greetings to all. Uh, Samuel and I enjoyed that video as well. Thanks Hugh for finding that uh, with the very modern um, shepherd with his Land Rover and sheepdogs. Quite a different picture from the uh, Palestinian pastoral scene. And a message as well from Joanna, Anne's daughter. Good morning and thank you everyone. We're also very grateful for the lovely messages about Anne. And thank you Hugh for the beautiful prayers. Best wishes, Joanna. And Diane and Roger say hello to you all, great hymns. It's nice to have feedback um, about these things because so obviously we don't get such a feel for how it goes, um, and whether people are singing along and so on as we would in church. Um, so thank you for those greetings. Um, I hope to see you in the Zoom coffee morning on Wednesday. Um, do email or phone if you need help with getting onto that. And may the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. And also with you. So do offer one another a sign of peace by perhaps sending a text or phoning one another up. Have a good week.